So for the last uh, uh, last uh, talk in the session, we have two speakers, Sylvie Schmidt and Miguel Aquila, correctly pronounced? Okay. Aquila, okay, th sorry. Um, those two come from the, uh, from the uh, FH Campus Wien, which is, uh, uh, I guess, one of the Fachhochschulen here in uh, Vienna, right? There are several, is it correct? Anyway. Um, there's large activity on IoT, on Riot, and also on security in, uh, in the FH Campus Vienna, and you are talking about the secure firmware updates now, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, so welcome to our talk about uh, secure firmware updates over the air within the IoT. Uh, first of all, um, we are Miguel Asila and Sylvie Schmidt, as we were introduced, to, introduced already. Yeah, I'm just going to sh shortly reintroduce myself. So I'm a graduate student at, at the FA Campus Wien, currently attending in the IT security master course there, and also software engineer at Porsche Informatik. And my bachelor thesis has focused on the secure update processes for the IoT, especially uh, on the focus on firm encryption. Yeah, and uh, I'm uh, of the academic staff uh, at the FA Campus Vienna at the master's degree program IT security. Uh, I'm also organizing uh, the IT security conference. It's now. Um, I'm uh, head of the Elvis lab, uh, the ten lab for IoT and security, and which should show that I'm focusing on IoT security for a couple of years now. Sharing the, oh, hey, you're on. No. Can you turn it off? Please. Okay, so um, as we heard before, uh, the process of a secure update uh, is one of the firmware updating is one of the most crucial uh, processes in the IoT because at, uh, at worst case your device is not uh, functioning anymore as it should. So uh, beforehand, some definitions uh, to make clear what we are talking about. Um, constraint devices are devices which uh, need a special uh, operating system, in our case, Riot OS, of course, uh, maybe no operating system at all. Um, yeah, constraint, empower, uh, memory, etc. Uh, when we talk about firmware, we are not talking about hardware or a software and hardware combination. We are talking about the software uh, running on the device. And yeah, abbreviations FOTA and SFOTA, I think, are quite uh, in. Uh, self-speaking firmware update over the air or secure firmware update over the air. Just as a short introduction or reminder, uh, the cryptographic objectives uh, regarding, uh, yeah, crypto, uh, from a cryptographical point of view are the CIE triad, uh, that's confidentiality, which means that only the intended uh, receiver is uh, able to understand the message. Integrity means that uh, the data or the messages are not altered or ma manipulated without notice of the receiver. Authenticity is so that it's clear who sent uh, the message and non-reputation is that, you, that the sender cannot deny he or she sent something. Uh, 
why I'm pointing out that is because uh, integrity and confidentiality and authenticity play a major role in the upcoming uh, explanations. So when we're uh, thinking about uh, a firmware update over the air, there are quite a couple of things that may go wrong, like, uh, I don't know, transmission failures, um, the wrong firmware uh, is uh, flashed to a device, uh, might be accidental, might be uh, a harmful uh, intention, um, like a bad firmware, we called it here, or simply just uh, transmission errors, a bit flipping or something like this. Um, we divided the, uh, this in two uh, major categories in safety and security. Safety issues are mainly uh, regarding transmission errors or failure or information loss. So maybe just part of the uh, image is transmitted. Uh, on the security side, um, an unauthorized device might receive my firmware or a third-party firmware might be flashed on my device, um, manipulated firmware, or uh, reverse engineering happens on the way on the transmission. The attacker gets uh, hold of my firmware and tries to reverse engineer it. So, in most of these cases, in all safety uh, issues we can solve the, uh, the problem by integrity, which means we uh, sign the firmware image or add a Mac, and then uh, it, is easy, it is noticed by the receiver if uh, the firmware was altered. Uh, on behalf of reverse engineering, for example, we, we would need more, and that would be uh, encryption. So integrity we solve with digital signatures or Macs and um, confidentiality uh, we solve through encryption. Um, here are a few requirements when it comes to a secure firmware update over the year. Of course, the first is security um, because when we, when we have an insecure firmware update over the air process, uh, the device is simply insecure. Uh, robust means uh, the update should not uh, harm the device, the functionality of the device. Atomic means the update should be, the update process should be completed or not done at all. Uh, Failsafe means that there's always some kind of way to fall back to a rollback to uh, an older version, functioning older version. Yeah, of course, we also have to think about remote management, etc. but that's not our focus today. Um, yeah, here are the, the main components of a secure firmware update over the air process. Um, we have a build system where the firmware is built. Uh, then we have this firmware management uh, system, the firmware management server. Um, in general, you will have uh, various devices with various architectures, with their uh, uh, various firmware uh, versions, etc. So you need a, a, some kind of firmware management server. Uh, also, um, also operating on all different kinds of security, like encryption or signing, uh, setting up the update package, which is sent to the device. And here we, all this transportation, etc., are uh, security challenges. Because in the IoT, we have constrained devices, we don't have as much memory, we don't have as much power we have with uh, a common PC, for example. So all these are challenges. And IT security 
costs not only money but memory uh, yeah power etc okay now we took a closer look at rfc 1919 that's the suit example uh, uh the suit um a framework um, and here we have uh, an example, just an example of uh, considerations which have to be uh, taken when it comes to uh, firmware updates over the air. And I don't want to read out uh, all now, but for example, is the firmware update process initiated by the client or by the server? Um, when should uh, the device be updated? When should this process uh, take place? Uh, what kind of uh, binary is the firmware of, etc. So you see there are a lot of con considerations which have to be taken for this. Yeah, conclusion in the meantime is, in general, stronger security results in weaker performance. Your trade-off is always the application scenario. Your scope of application determines what kind of security you need uh, and what is more important at the end, the security or performance loss. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, integrity is quite easily achieved by simply signing the, the firmware packages. Um, of very often that's the only implemented security feature because it already solves a lot of uh, issues, but not everything. As I mentioned before, confidentiality we cannot achieve uh, via uh, signatures or Macs. So there are uh, various update strategies besides the cryptographic uh, um, issues i think it's not necessary to point at all these uh, this is for for example memory partitioning this is a strategic strategy where i decide i have an uh, area where the running firmware is uh, located an update area where all the checks the, the verification decryption etc is done and in an optimal, uh, optimal case, I uh, also have an uh, area for a backup. And for example, here we have um, the incremental update, uh, sometimes uh, called also uh, the delta update, where we only upload uh, the part, the new part of the firmware. This is less common within the IoT, in the IoT, we often, uh, just for simplification, uh, flash the whole uh, firmware. We upload the whole new firmware and flash it over the old one. Here, uh, because I mentioned suit and my colleague uh, implemented the encryption for the suit uh, example in Riot OS, uh, I want to mention that there are some other uh, frameworks as well. Um, for example, for remote IoT device management, the uh, lightweight machine-to-machine -machine protocol is quite common. Uh, Komi OCF TR69, um, I just read that it's the most used in a, in a uh, protocol in the industrial environment. And of course, there are also update frameworks besides suit. Uh, suit. I think it's around 2016, 2017 uh, working group within the IETF. Now it's an RFC 1919, as I mentioned before. It's the successor of FOSE. Um, Uptain is mainly uh, meant for connected cars. MCU boot for ESP8266 microcontrollers, and so on. Of course, we also have something blockchain-based like Chaniac. And I think Swapdate is also quite common and, and, and uh, popular. Now, but 
We wanted to focus on Suit, a software update for the IoT. As I mentioned before, IETF Working Group RFC 1919, it consists of a simple back, uh, backend architecture. Uh, it provides uh, authentication, integrity protection, uh, encryption of the firmware in which, and uh, it is meant to be secure even when the updates are stored on untrusted repositories. Uh, here is a, yeah, I think you should see that. Here's a, um, a sketch of the architecture. Uh, first of all, here we have the author of the firmware. Um, we fetch the firmware uh, image plus its manifest. The manifest is the heart of the suit uh, RFC, of the suit standard. My colleague will go. Uh, will tell you about it in more detail. Yeah, then here we have uh, the device operator, the device management, which also consists of a status tracker server. Uh, after the uh, firmware is fetched, the image plus the manifest is uploaded to the image server. Um, the tracker server notifies um, the network operator and then the image and the manifest are fetched by the device. Here we also have the firmware uh, installation and verification uh, process within the network operator. Yeah, uh, SUIT offers state-of-the-art security mechanisms. Um, there is a mandatory set of uh, uh, algorithms which have to be implemented with a minimum key length of 112 bit for symmetric cryptography and so on. Yeah. Now uh, let my colleague tell you in more detail about the manifest and the encryption implementation. Thank you, Sylvie. Well, now I'm going to talk more about, more in depth about the suit, especially the essence of it, the suit manifest. So a manifest is a bundle of metadata about the firmware. For example, it can be uh, where, where's the firmware, where can it be fetched, which devices do we need to update, or where do we store the firmware image. And more, much more metadata can be found in this RC, the 9124, which specifies which information elements must, should, or can be included in a manifest. And the suit manifest builds uh, upon this, uh, this RFC. And the suit manifest describes on how to format these information elements. And it is very compact. It is uh, serialized in the CBOR uh, format. Uh, and currently, it is still under draft on version 27, which has been uh, published in July. And devices also need to be able to understand the manifest. Therefore, each of them needs a parser to understand each and every step the manifest uh, gives. Now I'm going to talk about the structure of the manifest. So the manifest actually is wrapped by an, by an envelope, and the envelope consists of an authentication wrapper. So the authentication wrapper is there because the manifest is usually signed. And inside this wrapper, there are cryptographic informations that protect the manifest. Then we have the manifest itself. And the next property, the severable elements, is a property that makes it possible to remove certain elements from the manifest without actually invalidating the signature. And lastly, the integrated payloads is for certain scenarios where adding, where including a payload makes sense for example, we send over an unconstrained medium where uh, we can send the manifest and the firmware image in one request, or we send over a very small payload, such as an encrypted key. Now we go on to the manifest itself. The manifest contains information about the structure version of the manifest, what sequence number it has, some common, uh, common structures, some common information, such as digest, vendor IDs, or class IDs. 
but the most important aspect of the manifest are the command sequences. The command sequences are basically our decision makers and tells the device on what they need to do during the update procedure. And such a command sequence is made out of a list of instructions, which then in turn is a pair of a command code to, to identify the, the step and possible arguments that you can send it over with. And there are three types of command sequences. We have the common sequences, which is needed to set some common metadata values that are used in subsequent instructions, but also to do comp compatibility checks. The next one are update commands. We tell the device to fetch the payload and then install it. And lastly, we got the validation or invocation commands, which does the system validation or image invocation. And as I've said before, the manifest is actually formatted in CBOR, but with the help of the uh, suit manifest generator in Riot, I have printed it out in a JSON format. There you can see that it, currently only the manifest resides in there. It is not signed, and it contains some information such as the manifest version, the sequence number, and also one of the instructions here in the install command sequence, where it basically tells nothing more than to set the URI where to fetch the command to this certain location. And also below that, you can see uh, the component ID to, uh, to identify which devices actually need to do this step. Now I'm happy to present you my bachelor thesis part of this presentation. So Wright has provided a suit example uh, uh, for, for us, but however, there's no firmware encryption and decryption. And when we, uh, when we introduce encryption, uh, it also solves the problem of mitigating, uh, it solves the problem of reverse engineering. So it's not sent over plain text anymore. And the suit manifest does not specify how the firmware encryption is done, but rather it is in an own publication in this one where it specifies which techniques or uh, algorithms are used during content key distribution or the content encrypt, uh, the, the payload encryption. Now let's circle back to the, to the architecture of SUIT because we have to change something in there in order to introduce encryption to, to this scheme. And we need to do following things. First one, uh, we need to encrypt the firmware image and add cryptographic information to the manifest and add additional instructions for the devices to know that they need to decrypt uh, the firmware image. And the firmware image and, and the devices themselves need to know uh, the, the, the instructions, they need to be able to parse it and understand that they need to decrypt it now and of course the functionality of decryption itself. Now I'm going to introduce you my, my setup, my proof of concept. And the first thing is that I have not included the device management in there, but rather I trigger the device from, I trigger the update from the device themselves. Speaking of device, I'm using the right native board, family board. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, which is the emulation of a, of a board that, uses, that makes use of the host resources. And for the image server, uh, the, I've used the IO Coop file server, which has been written by one of our hosts, and this and uh, is in is a local file server for the manifest and the images. And lastly, encryption was done with a Python script with the help of a PyCrypto CryptoDome library. And to sum it up again, our local file server is the IO Coop. The device is the right native. And the encryption scheme used is the AES CCM128. And there's a, special re there's a reasoning for that. Uh, usually, the recommended one is to use GCM. However, the crypto library in Riot uh, does not provide a GCM, uh, a GCM uh, library yet for, for the devices, for, for the parser. And therefore, the next best one I've chosen is the CCM one. What is not included in this uh, proof concept is the key exchange. So this is part of a future work and verification is done via Wireshark.
So I've added in the manifest two new instructions for the devices to know that they need to decrypt the deform image. The first one says that it needs to set some cryptographic information necessary. And the second instruction below that tells the device to start decrypting. And now we go on to the live demo where I will show you both the base example of the suit update and my modifications of it. So I've prepared the, the, the network interfaces and also on, on the top left side, you can see that I've started the local file server with uh, serving contents of the directory co-op root. I am this, uh, I'm, uh, listening to the specific port, uh, add to the specific interface and uh, save the, save the co-op requests and then uh, show it in Wireshark, and now I, I can show you a practical example of how a manifest looks like. First one, I'm going to show you how, how, an, how the base suit manifest looks like. There we can see that uh, currently it is not signed because the authentication wrapper is empty and all the previous uh, properties as I told you earlier, and some more instructions that I've commented out. And notice how, uh... oh yeah, sorry. And sorry, this, was, uh, this one was the encrypted one because I have added here the additional steps to in order to decrypt the deformer image, but now I'm going to show you the, the unencrypted version. where we see it, it, it is similar. However, uh, the additional instructions that I've listed in the validation steps are not there anymore. And now we build the right native device with a command that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And I'm also going to start listening on, on the interface to capture the packets. First, I have to configure, configure the interface to be able to talk to the file server. And then I'm going to fetch, fetch first the unencrypted manifest with the following command. And it logs a lot of stuff, which is the default for, for the example. And if we stop the, the TCP dump and open it in Wireshark, we see that it has fetched the manifest first, the so blockwise, and then afterwards, since there was an instruction to fetch the payload, it also fetched the payload blockwise. And in its contents, we can see that it is sent over plain text. We can read out that it says Elvis IoT CCM. Now let's do the the other manifest, which, is, uh, which introduces encryption and decryption. There I have to restart the, the TCP dump and build the right native device again. And now we choose to fetch the signed manifest. And in my example, I have added additional logging for debugging reasons. And there you can see that, that it was successfully decrypted inside the device. And if we look into the packet that was sent, this would be this one. And now if we try to look into the content, we cannot decipher it anymore, we cannot read it anymore, so we've added confidentiality into the suit procedure. And now going back to the presentation, 
Uh, my last point is what have I, what, what have I especially learned about it where I've got to know uh, there's a sanitization effort going on for uh, secure updates over the air, that it is a modular and flexible approach. So once I understood the code base, I've added minimal changes to it in order to introduce the security paradigm to it. And future work of it may be to, uh, to try it out on physical devices to compare uh, performances in terms of uh, resource usage with and without the encryption part. Another one would be to uh, implement the key exchange. And lastly, to update suit, the, the suit code base because it is based on an older uh, draft version of the suit uh, documentation. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, question, because you were mentioning uh, missing ciphers, uh, what uh, uh, security library did you use in Riot? I'm sorry, missing, missing what? Uh, which security library did you use in, in Riot? In Riot, uh, I've used the CCM one. So, so there, there was a oh, folder CCM called Crypto, a, a... and I've used the CCM. Uh, the, the, the CCM files for it. No, I, I mean, which, uh, which code base of... of uh... uh, no, no, I, I, I haven't. I've, I've just used uh, the, 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 the directly from the crypto folder, the CCM files. Uh, okay, so... Anyway, questions, comments, remarks, updates? Test, test, test. Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation and thanks for, for doing the implementation work. Um, uh, which version of the, the draft did you uh, do your implementation on? Was that draft 20, which was very recent? Uh, I have done the, so, so for the, do, do you mean for the firmware encryption? Uh, no, I just based it on the on on the, the next best one because the documentation stated that either GCM or CBC was the one, but I didn't find CCM, so I've I've just used CCM for that. But uh, the manifest. Oh, yeah, um, the manifest. Um, I've used the the version which was in in the right example, so I haven't updated it. Okay, so that's okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it would be good to uh, if someone could update that version because we the, the code of that version. I'm, I'm looking at uh, uh, around for help, but because uh, we made a few changes after that version, of course, because otherwise, what would be doing? In, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, one uh, because one change specifically would be interesting. Um, it would enable you to include those parameters that you need for the CCM implementation or for the, uh, the uh, that was the, I think this was the nonce and the uh, additional data, you could include that outside in a, in a wrapper, which would be more convenient, I think. Oh, okay. That Good would, to know. Yeah, that's a, that's a, very, uh, that's a recent, more recent thing, uh, but uh, I think that would make it easier for you for the implementation, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's uh, also, uh, what would also be interesting is since you mentioned the, the key management, um, there are two versions of the key management currently provided. One is the AES uh, key wrap, which is a symmetric key based version. And the other one is the um, ephemeral static Diffie Hellman. Um, but we initially wanted to support HPKE, hybrid public key encryption. and Unfortunately, because of the way how this went in, in, the, uh, in another working group, in the COSI working group, we removed it. But I think it would be a really cool uh, mechanism because it's, uh, lots of people are using HPKE in all sorts of places. Um, and if someone could look you, or uh, I don't want to extend your thesis, uh, uh, but maybe someone else. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe my master thesis. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, that would be really good uh, because that's still also in debate, unfortunately. So it wasn't as smooth as I was hoping. So great work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um.
<clears throat> Hi. Uh, when you mentioned the minimal cryptographic key lengths at the beginning, you had symmetric keys with 112 bit and elliptic curves is 233 bits. Those are quite uncommon key lengths. Where do they come from? Is this some strange lightweight algorithm? Uh, when I just looked at the slides, I, I thought that to myself, but uh, I, did, <laughs> I, I did the research uh, for these papers two or three years ago using the, the suit paper. So I don't know, might be a typo. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I copied it in there because uh, it was taken out. It was actually, as you said, it was, uh, it was taken from uh, research uh, because it's basically an estimate on how uh, the equivalent strength of symmetric key applies to asymmetric crypto. So it's, I think it was, uh, some researchers did that analysis. Uh, I copied it from an ENISA, I believe, specification, and they did it exactly. So it's uh, unfortunately too bad that none of those really, those numbers really exist in, in Keylands, but uh, that's what you get when you take the most advanced attack and compare the numbers, compare the runtime of the attack, that's what the numbers you get. Okay. Okay, so if no more questions around, I guess we are ready for the coffee break. And we thank all three speak, all four speakers again. <laughs> <laughs>